found in 1 Kings 18. I'll just read you just a section, the most relevant section here. It says, God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. The Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. The story is actually the inspiration for the hymn that we just sang, which is one of my favorite hymns. Uh, written, the lyrics written by John Greenleaf Whittier, and some of you may know that he received the inspiration from it by climbing uh, Mount Rattlesnake, that he likened to uh, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of the Sea. And it ends, speak through the earthquake, wind and final, still, small voice of calm. So that was a theme of the retreat. My wife and I were looking forward to hearing the still, small voice of God. The first half of the day was good. We were asked to, uh, we were, we read some psalms, we were asked to write a psalm, which each of us did. Then after lunch, we got into this passage in, in First Kings. And the leader used a practice called Lectio Divina, which is the slow, meditative reading of a passage of scripture. And the, the people would gather uh, to listen to this passage of scripture, imagine it in their imagination. The reader brought us all the way through the story of Elijah, starting with the contest of the, with the 400 prophets of, of Baal on Mount Carmel, then his flight into the wilderness, and then his trip uh, to Mount Horeb, and finally to standing on the side of the mountain, hearing the still, small voice of God. We were supposed to get into the character, get into the, the character of Elijah, which I did. That was the problem. <laughs> After doing this for about 20 or 30 minutes, the leader stopped and asked people to share their thoughts, what we had experienced during this time of, of silent prayer, listening to scripture. And many people shared their inspirational insights, some quite beautiful. Then it was my turn. And I told the leader of the group that I had a problem with Elijah very near the beginning of the reading. While well, I was still at Mount Carmel before I got anywhere near Mount Horeb, long before the still small voice. I said that I found that I could not identify with Elijah. Because as I was imagining this, all I could imagine was Elijah covered in the blood of the 450 preachers whom he had personally slaughtered. I told them that I was experiencing Elijah as a mass murderer. Now, you can imagine the reaction to <laughs> of all these preachers and spouses here. We were supposed to be having nice thoughts. Lovely, inspirational thoughts. And I broke the rules by saying that the hero of the story I considered to be a criminal. The people gathered there, there were about 30, 30, 35 people did not say a word. <laughs> the leader had just stared at me. <laughs> so I played nice and I shut up so that people could get back to their nice spiritual thoughts. Well, I'm not going to shut up this morning, especially after the, the shooting at the church last Sunday, which was the deadliest shooting in a house of worship in American history. I'm not going to shut up, it's not going to scream bloody murder. The reason my mind went to that dark place, I think, on October 14th, was because the mass shooting in Las Vegas was still fresh in my mind. That had happened just two weeks, two weeks before, October 1st. That Sunday night incident was the deadliest mass shooting in United States history. 58 people were killed. 459 were, were wounded. Two weeks later, that I was sitting in a monastery listening to the voice, listening to the story of Elijah, who had personally killed 450 people. Now maybe it was because the number 450 kind of registered with me. It was so close to the 459, 489 Las Vegas. In any case, my mind made the connection 
between the slaughter on Mount Carmel and the slaughter in Las Vegas. For those of you who might not be familiar with the biblical story and how these killings came about, let me just tell it briefly for you. It is found in 1 Kings chapter 18. This was a time of religious rivalry and persecution. Israel was ruled by King Ahab and his queen Jezebel. These are the two villains of the story. They truly were not nice people. Jezebel was a worshiper of Baal and Asherah. And she had, become, had begun a systematic persecution of all the prophets of Yahweh, the God of Israel. A man named Obadiah had intervened and had hidden the last 100 prophets of the Lord in caves. And this is where Elijah, the prophet Elijah, enters the story. He decides he's going to challenge the prophets, prophets of Baal to a contest on Mount Carmel, which is a mountain overlooking present-day Haifa, which is a beautiful spot. In fact, one of our trips to the Holy Land, we, we spent a night at, at the Carmelite Monastery on Mount Carmel. This was the contest Elijah proposed. They would offer two sacrifices on two different altars, one to Baal, one to Yahweh, who is the God of Israel. They would each take a bull as a sacrifice, they would slaughter it, and they would place it on the wood, but they would not light the fire. That was up to the God to do. They would call the name of their God, and whichever God answered by consuming the offering by fire would be proven to be the true God, and the people would agree to worship that God. People thought that sounded like a pretty good test, so they agreed. So the 450 prophets of Baal prepared their sacrifice, placed it on the wood. They prayed that their God would come down and consume the offering. Nothing happened. They prayed, they chanted, and they danced around the altar. After a few hours, Elijah, who was watching all this, began to make fun of them. Let me read for you what he, what he said. It says, and so it was at noon that Elijah mocked to them and said, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping, and must be awakened. Now, actually, the Hebrew text does not say perhaps he was meditating. It says perhaps Baal was off using the outhouse. <laughs> this infuriated the prophets of Baal. And it goes on to say, So they cried aloud and cut themselves as was their custom, with knives and lances, until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was past, they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Now it was Elijah's turn. So he repaired the altar of Yahweh, which had fallen into disuse. He put wood on the altar. He put the, the sacrifice on the wood being the showman that he was, he then decided to make it look even better, so he poured bucket after bucket of water on the wood, so much water said that it filled a trench that was, had been dug around the altar. And then he called the name of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. And let me read you what happened next, which is, which was our reading for, our, for, for today. It says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood and the stones and the dust. So it consumed a lot, everything. It licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and executed them there. Did you hear what Elijah did? He ordered the people to seize the 450 prophets of Baal, and he personally executed them. The next the first verse in the next chapter says that he did it with a sword. Now, as I was hearing this story, my eyes closed, read at Western Priory, all I could picture when I heard that was those videos of ISIS terrorists beheading Ethiopian Christians. And here was the prophet of my God, Elijah, doing
doing what looked like the same sort of thing. Beheading 450 religious leaders simply because they worship a different god. It made me sick. I almost walked right out of the room at that moment. It still makes me sick. And I still, to be honest, I could not understand how a, a room full of Christian preachers could listen to the slaughter of preachers, to this atrocity done in the name of our God, and not even hear it. Just kind of glide right over, move on to better things, move on to the still small voice. I could not move on. I think that's the problem with our society. <coughs> we move on too quickly. Last Sunday morning was this terrible shooting in the Baptist church in Texas. And already people were moving on. We had too easily glossed over these atrocities that happen on a regular basis. We see in the evening news a terrible mass, mass murder. We are upset for a little while and we'll pray about it in church. Our Republican and Democratic leaders will blame each other or blame the NRA for a few days. And then the news channels move on to more important things like the latest tweet from the president. And that's it. Until the next mass murder, followed by more candlelight vigils, and the cycle repeats itself. I want to make it clear up front that I don't have an answer to the culture of violence in our country and the world. I personally think, I know that this is a controversial subject, you don't have to agree with me, but I personally think that stricter or at least smarter gun control laws would help. I think that semi-automatic weapons ought to be outlawed. But when I think about it, when I think it all the way through, I realize that even that is not going to prevent these shootings from happening. They'll cut down on the carnage, which is a good thing, and that's why I think we ought to do it, but it's not going to stop it. When I think about what type of gun control could possibly stop these shootings, I realize that we would have to get rid of all the guns in the country to stop the gun violence. But then only the government would have guns, and that sounds very scary to me. <laughs> not to mention the violation of the Bill of Rights. As much as I wish it would, I do not think that limited gun control would really stop these shootings any more than sword control would have stopped mass massacres in biblical times. Homo sapiens will find some way to kill each other. We've been doing it since Cain and Abel. All Cain had was a rock to hit his brother over the head with. I'm sure there was a call for rock control. Back then. <laughs> the root problem is human nature. We are a violent species. The Bible calls it our sin nature. There is violence in the human heart. The only real solution is a change of heart. And only God can do that. But in the meantime, I think we have to do something to keep weapons out of the hands of mentally and emotionally unstable people. I think a lot of the problem is mental illness. And we can do something about that if we're willing to put money into better mental health care. To me, there also seems to be a connection between suicide and homicide. A lot of these killers, I think, are suicidal. That is a mental health issue. There must be some way to better identify these people before they commit these horrible crimes. To be honest, I think religion is part of the problem. It needs to be part of the solution. I don't think we Christians have come to grips with the religious violence that is done in the name of God in the Bible, in the effect that it has on American society and Western civilization. We need to acknowledge and confront this head on. We have to do something to stop people like Elijah from doing what he did, inciting his listeners to murder 450 preachers for no other reason than that they, they worship the wrong God. Now, many people assume in reading the Bible 
read the story that God told Elijah to do this. But when you read the story carefully, the passage does not say that God told Elijah to do this. He did not need to kill them. In fact, it would have been a lot better if he hadn't. He had already proven his point. The people had already renounced Baal and proclaimed their allegiance to Yahweh. These prophets of Baal had not hurt anyone, as far as we know. They were just religious leaders. But religious zeal seemed to consume, over, overpower Elijah, and he committed this atrocity in the name of our God. And there's no way to justify what he did. And I think that he knew it. I think that his guilt over doing this is the backdrop for everything else that happens the rest of this chapter and the next chapter. Now this is a new way of interpreting this story, but hear me out. Shortly after this episode, Elijah flees into the wilderness. Queen Jezebel had heard what he had done, and he said that he was going to do the same thing to, to Elijah that he had done to her prophets of Baal. So he's scared, and he runs for his life. And it says, he went himself a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. And he said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. I am no better than my father's. Now, what's he talking about there? I think he's talking about murdering these people. When it comes to, then comes a scene where God strengthens him. And he travels for 40 days until he reaches Horeb, the mountain of God. He spends the night in a cave on that mountain. And then it says he went into the cave spent the night in that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God says, What are you doing here? You see, God did not tell him to come there. Elijah went there because he was feeling bad about what he had done. He tries two times in this dialogue here to justify his actions. Both times when God asks him, asks him, What are you doing here? Elijah replies this way. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. He's trying to justify his actions. But what he says here to God is not true. He's not the only one left. They haven't killed all the prophets of God. We were told earlier, and I mentioned it, that Obadiah had hidden 100 other prophets in caves. Elijah knew that. Elijah is trying to make the situation sound as bad as possible in order to justify what he had done. But there's no excuse for his actions. He knows it. God knows it. God tells him to stand on the mountainside. A great wind came, it said, but God was not in the wind. Earthquake came, but God was not in the earthquake. A fire came, but God was not in the fire. Then it says, after the fire, a still, small voice. And almost all interpreters assume that God was in the still, small voice. But once again, when you read it, it doesn't say that. One commentator wrote, 1 Kings 19 is one of the top three most abused molested, isogetic, twisted, and assumed verses in the entire Bible. Now the Hebrew phrase used here, or still small voice, means silence or stillness. It literally is translated, can be translated, the sound of silence. In fact, that is how one translation, the new RSV, the Revised Standard Version, translates it, as a sound of sheer silence. God was not speaking to Elijah, and a still small voice. It's saying just the opposite. It's saying that there was complete silence. That God was silent. That is evident in the next verse. When Elijah realized that God was not speaking to him, he says he wrapped, him, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Then God speaks to him, and he asks again, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah gives him the same old spiel, the same lame excuse and lie that he gave before. In response, God rejected Elijah because of his sin and repentance. And the next verse is what God tells Elijah to do. 
He says, Elisha, the son of, the son of Shaphat, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. See what he's doing? Elijah is getting fired. <laughs> he's supposed to appoint, appoint someone else to take his place. Well, then I'm supposed to train that person to do his job. God was doing the same sort of thing with Elijah, I think, which he had done previously with King Saul and David. If you remember that story, God rejected Saul as king, and Samuel anointed David at his place, but David did not take over as king right away. Saul was still acting king for quite a while until he died, but he no longer had the blessing of God. I think the same sort of thing was happening here. Elijah was still acting as prophet for a little while, but pretty soon he is forcibly pulled from the stage, literally, in a fiery chariot. What Elijah had done was inexcusable. And it is inexcusable when it happens today. It is inexcusable when ISIS, Muslims do it to Christians. It's wrong when a Texas man does it to Baptists. It is inexcusable when Burmese Buddhists do it to Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar. It was inexcusable when the Nazis did it and when the Christian Crusaders did it. It is inexcusable when it happens in the Bible. It is inexcusable when we downplay it and we ignore it. We need to keep this issue of violence in the forefront of our religious discussion, not just a political discussion, especially the role that violence plays in the Bible and in church history. As Christians, we need to proclaim a God Justice and peace. God can change hearts and minds through the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is at essence, I believe, a gospel of nonviolence, a gospel of love of enemies, a gospel of unconditional love. God can change hearts. God can change our country. God can even change Christianity. May God help us. Lord God, we lift this issue up to you. We know that it's a difficult one to think about, to talk about, and to preach about. We know it's a difficult one for us as a society to deal with. We seem to be so divided over political issues involving this one. This is a moral, this is a spiritual issue. Lord, we ask your help to work within our country, work within your church to bring a solution to this. Yes, it's in Christ's name. Amen.